In this video, I'll explain and demonstrate how to use the statistical process control method to analyze data from single subject research designs. Statistical process control is a unique application of a statistical model that can be used to evaluate variability in single subject data. This process was actually developed in the 1920s to, as a means of quality control in the manufacturing process. So the basis of the, the process lies in the desire to reduce variation in an outcome or to identify variation in an outcome. So traditionally it was used to measure the consistency in production of a manufactured item. And so maintaining or identifying consistency was desirable. So we can, however, expect there's going to be some vari variability in the quality. So for example, cars can come off the assembly line with some defects, clothing can have some irregularities. And so a certain amount of variation in anything that we can measure is random, expected and tolerable. So this variation is considered background noise or background error or background variability. And traditionally this has been termed common cause variation. And so statistically such variation is considered to be in control or that the variation is predictable or expected. However, there will be a point at which variation will exceed an acceptable limit, and the product, in the case of manufacturing, will no longer be considered satisfactory. That is, there's a certain amount of variation that is identified as problematic in the production. And so that amount of deviation would be considered out of control and is called special cause variation. So this is variation that is unexpected, intermittent, or not part of the normal process. So consider, for example, the variation you might have in your own mood from day to day. So if you were to measure your mood over the course of 10 days, there's going to be a certain degree of expected or, or common cause variation. In other words, your mood is going to change from day to day depending on the random effects of fatigue, distraction, work, personal life, and, and so on. However, if someone comes or if there's an event that occurs in your life in which that could drastically change your mood, a death in the family or maybe you get a promotion or some other adverse or pleasurable uh, event occurs, your mood could become markedly different. And this marked difference or variation in your mood would be called a special cause variation. So we can usually think about these kinds of variations in the context of reliability. So how much variation in a measurement can we see that is random error? And how much is meaningful or due to true changes in a response, such as brought about by an intervention or some sort of a treatment? So how do we apply, apply statistical process control to single subject data? Well, we can apply this model to single subject designs in, in two basic ways. First, we can look at the baseline data, and we can determine if responses are within the limits of common cause variation, in other words, the expected variability. This would allow us to assess the degree to which the data represents a reasonable baseline. Now, sometimes extreme variability within a baseline can obscure the treatment effects. So we may also find that one point exceeds the limits of common cause and can be perhaps accounted for by special circumstances, some sort of history effect thereby discounting the variation is important. Maybe something adverse happened at that particular time point. So for instance, we may find that a subject's responses over the baseline period are consistent except for one day when that person did not feel well or maybe a different clinician took the measurements. So by analyzing the circumstances of special cause we may see in the baseline, we can often, often determine if the response is significant. Now we can also look at the degree to which the intervention responses vary from the baseline with the intent of assigning special cause to the intervention. In other words, we want the treatment to cause a meaningful change in the subject responses. And so the statistical process control offers a way for us to determine if variations in response are of a significant or sufficient enough magnitude to warrant this change as special cause. In other words, the treatment created the change in the measurement that we're seeing in relation to the original baseline measurements. So this 
method, statistical process control, is based upon analysis of graphs that are called control charts. Um, these are the same as graphs we've been using to look at um, the two standard deviation and the acceleration line, although there are some differences depending on the type of data being measured. Um, what I'm going to demonstrate here is known as the X moving range chart, which is used with continuous variables. And there are other types of charts that can be used when working with um, dichotomous outcomes. And we are going to use Excel to graph this, this particular um, method. So in statistical process control, the interpretation of the data is based on variability around a mean value. So a central line or a line denoting the mean of the baseline scores is plotted. And this represents the mean response for that particular phase. And then we can we calculate two thresholds that we can place around that mean that are called the upper control limit or UCL and the lower control limit or the LCL. And these are plotted at three standard deviations above and below that baseline mean. Now, regardless of the underlying distribution, almost all data will typically fall within plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean, if the data are stable. In other words, if the process is in statistical control. Therefore, these boundaries then define the threshold for special cause. So if a data point is above or below these control limits, then we would consider that data point being affected by special cause or having special cause variation. So there's a couple ways we can define what special cause might be. And there's three basic rules that we utilize. And the first is that if any one point falls outside the UCL or the LCL, we would consider that to be a special cause variation. I'll, show, I'll demonstrate some, some examples here in a second using graphs. The second rule would be if there are seven or more consecutive points that are either all above or below the center mean line. And this is called a run. And the third rule is if we have six or more consecutive points that seem to be moving up or down across the center mean line. In other words, the, the data points seem to be traveling in a direction up or down and they're crossing that center mean line. This is known as a trend. So let's go ahead and look at some examples of that. So the first example, uh, graph A here, shows an example of that first rule. So this thick center line denotes the mean of the baseline data, and each of these points represents a measurement at baseline of the outcome. The dotted lines above and below represent our control limits, our upper and lower control limit, respectively. And so we can see here we have a data, single data point that is resting above the upper control limit line. So this would be an example of a special cause variation. We have this data point that is above the level of what we consider to be common cause variance or random variance. Now chart B gives an example of our second rule where we have a run of data points that are all above that mean line for the baseline data. So initially we have data that falls here, and then we have a consistent run of data points that are all above the mean score for that baseline. So that would also be considered special cause. And then the last one is the third rule, example of the third rule we talked about, and that's where we have a group of data that are, is traveling in a direction that then eventually crosses that mean line of the baseline data. So we can see here at data point number five, we see a steady decline towards data point number 11 that crosses that center mean line. So these are all three graphical examples of those rules in which this would be considered to be special cause variation. In other words, something is creating this difference um, in this, these runs or trends or the single placement of a data point that goes beyond just what we would consider to be random variation. There's something systematic about this variation. So what I'd like to do next is go ahead and demonstrate how we would set up this graph in Excel and then how we could look at the baseline data to make sure it falls within common cause variation and then look at some hypothetical treatment data to see if it would then be considered to fall in special cause variation. And then we can look at this 
and make determinations as to whether or not the treatment phase data is different than the baseline phase data. So what I have here in this Excel spreadsheet is uh, the same data we used in some of our other demonstrations with acceleration lines and standard deviation band methods. And along the top here is my actual data that's been collected. So first let's look at the baseline data um, and how this is then used to create these upper and lower control limits that we can then use to compare to the um, treatment phase data. So the top row are the number of sessions, so the number of, of measurements, so the first measurement, second measurement, third measurement, and so on. And below that is the measurement of the outcome that we're interested in. And again, this is a, a numeric value of whatever it is we're, we're measuring as our outcome. So we first want to examine this baseline data um, is, is the first step in the process. So what I've done is created kind of another table here in which I've listed my my number of measurements in the baseline and I've listed my actual baseline scores again this is data that's brought down directly from those first two rows and so the first step in this process is to is to calculate the mean of the baseline scores because this is going to be one of the lines that we're going to place on our graph so I just use the simple average um, measurement for the baseline scores and so the mean of our uh, 10 baseline scores is a score of 5. Okay, So that's the first step, compute the mean of the baseline scores. The next step is to calculate what's known as the moving range. And so what we basically do is we take the second score in our baseline set of scores and from that subtract the first score. So we take 5 minus 3 and that gives us our first moving range score. So you'll note there's no score in the first row because 3 is the first score. So we have a moving range score for the first pair of data of 2. We then go to the third score and from it we subtract the second score and that gives us a moving range score of minus 1. And we do that for all of the data points so that each pair of data has a moving range score. Now, we don't need the sign. Some of them will be negative, some of them will be positive. So we get the absolute moving range score. In other words, we take the sign off. A minus 1 just becomes a 1. And then we're going to sum those moving range scores, which is what we're going to see here in this cell. So the sum of the moving range scores is 13. OK, the next step we need to do is compute the mean of the moving range. So we have these, these nine moving range scores, or actually these nine moving range scores, and we're going to find the mean of those nine scores. So that ends up being a, a value of 1.4. We also want to calculate the standard deviation of this moving range, and that would be 1.3. Now the standard deviation of the moving range is calculated using a standardized formula. It's basically the sum of the moving range, or I'm sorry, the, the mean of the moving range divided by a standard score of 1.128 and you'll see that here in the formula. So the mean of the moving range is divided by 1.28 and that gives us our standard deviation of the moving range. And then now we have everything we need in order to, to determine what our upper control limit and lower control limits will be. And so the formula for the upper control limit is basically taking the mean of the baseline scores and adding the standard deviation times 3. So 3 standard deviations, 1.3 times 3 plus 5 is basically 8.8. .8. Now for the lower control limit, we take 3 times that standard deviation and we subtract it from the baseline mean of 5. So we end up with a lower control limit of 1.2. So now we have the three elements that we need in order to create our upper and lower control limits so that we can then first assess the baseline data. 
So in order to do these, we're going to basically insert um, a line or a series of lines. So the first thing we want to do is go ahead and insert a line that represents our mean score. So our mean score for the baseline data, as you remember, is a score of 5. So we're going to go ahead and insert a line that represents that baseline mean of 5, and we're going to carry that all the way across into the treatment phase. Okay, And we'll go ahead and, and do a little bit of formatting on it. We'll make it a little bit thicker. Uh, make it black, we'll make it a little bit thicker so that we're going to be able to differentiate that that is the mean of the baseline data. Okay, our next step is to go ahead and include the upper and lower control limit lines. And so again, I have a value here I can work with, 8.8, .8, and I'm going to go ahead and draw another line. just below 9 here. And again, I'm going to carry that all the way across. Okay. Oops, it's a little bit not quite horizontal. Okay, so I, I have my UCL line now and I go ahead and made that a little thicker and also made it a dashed line so I can differentiate it from the mean line. And then I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing for the lower control limit line. So I've got my value of 1.2, so I'm going to go ahead and insert a line at that 1.2 value or as closely as I can approximate it. Okay, so I went ahead and formatted that line as well. So now I have my mean baseline line, I have my upper control limit line, and my lower control limit line. So the first thing I want to do is I want to examine the baseline data to see if the baseline data all falls within common cause variation. And we can see a little bit of up and down here, but all these data points are well within my upper and lower control limit lines. So that indicates that the data in the baseline had some variability, but it's all we would consider to be random variability. It's all common cause variability. So this is what we would hope to see in a stable baseline measurement. Okay, so we've extended our control limits all the way into the treatment phase. So now we can look at the treatment phase data and compare it to our UCLs to see if any of the treatment phase data has special cause variation. And so we can see that of the 10 points in the treatment phase, nine of those points fall above the UCL or outside the UCL. And so this indicates that there is definitely some special cause variation in the treatment phase. And this would then indicate to us that there is a significant difference in the response in the treatment phase compared to the baseline phase. And so that would indicate to us that the treatment is probably creating this special cause variation and the treatment has had an impact on the outcome response that we're measuring. So to summarize, what we did uh, in this particular technique is we used another uh, visual graphing way to examine variability in single subject data. So we use what's called the statistical process control method in which we develop a mean line and then an upper and lower control limit line. And we can use that to visualize the variability in the baseline data and then also visualize the variability in the treatment phase data relative to that baseline data. And this allows us to make conclusions of whether or not the treatment data is now different enough from the baseline data to say that the intervention of the treatment probably created that difference. So hopefully you found this uh, technique useful and this video informative. And good luck using this technique. 